Hey there, Video Insiders. Welcome to your podcast. He's Carlos Pacheco. And he's Tom Martin. And we're two grizzled YouTube industry veterans with billions of views between us. And we're here to give you our two cents on the business of YouTube so you can make more dollars. News, strategy, insight, and just a sprinkling of snark. What's the word on the street, Tom? All good this week, Carlos. Very happy here to be speaking to you. It's been a bit of a crazy week. Lots and lots going on here in the new and improved home office. I've uh, oh. finally put up my cork pin board uh, and <laughs> my um, whiteboard. They've got nothing on them of any use, but at least I have them. And I've got a bookshelf up. I've always wanted to put a bookshelf up with all my um, my business books. Um, so I look smart if anyone should come to this tiny office. But um, I have done some actual work as well. I haven't just been doing that, but that has been the most exciting thing. Yeah. Um, it sounds like the the perfect YouTuber setup staging area. It is good if I had double the depth so I could actually get a camera that could fit that all in <laughs> onto, <laughs> onto a camera. But um no. Well, luckily for me, I, luckily for me, I don't really make videos anymore. Yeah. Uh, and maybe something we'll probably speak about a little bit more uh, in another episode. But yeah, I'm kind of off of that train. Um, I did enjoy it making videos and kind of doing that how to kind of YouTube stuff. But um, you probably remember you were one of the few people that actually watched. But when I when I finally left the corporate world, I made 31 videos in my first 31 oh, days and geez was that a mistake <laughs> that was such a waste of time um lots of lessons learned the main one being don't make 31 videos in 31 days yeah i mean one of the things that first off i don't consider it a mistake you learned a lesson right did, and you know i gave my try in terms of doing videos and again we might have a, a, a podcast dedicated to this why these guys are so youtube veterans or blah 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 and you know they don't have their own youtube channels but at the same time like yes i did try to vlog a couple of times and i do experiment here and there but i have absolutely no patience for editing um yeah. so yeah uh, you were my hero when you were doing that and i was like <laughs> i cannot i cannot do this what's the word on the streets of uh toronto <laughs> the word on the streets of toronto is that they're wet soggy uh frozen depending on the day right? Every, every day is different. So, you know, this week is adjusting, you know, like we have staff in our office, so we've had a pretty mild winter and people were coming in with their shoes and not having any issues. And all of a sudden we got this dumping of snow over the weekend and then uh, people are all coming in. I know it's trivial stuff, but it's like, you don't think about this stuff. I mean, I've never managed an office before. And yeah. it's like, you know, within within hours, our office was a complete mess. So we had to set rules, you know, and I'm like, ah, oh, <laughs> I'm becoming corporate. <laughs> you're, the, you're the office dad. You're the, yeah. den, you're the den mother. Exactly, exactly. So that's a, you know, there's nothing other than that uh, news wise for me is just, you know, dealing with uh, some clients. You know, I had an awesome client over the weekend that we started as YouTube from scratch. And when we start YouTube, c corporate YouTube channels, we obviously have some budget set aside for boosting because it's corporate. At the end of the day, like you still need to sort of boost it. Yeah. But he's, he's grown so well and he's jumped into this scene to a point where like he released a video on the weekend and it got like a thousand views in a day organically. And he's like ecstatic, right? He's actually told me, it's like, I don't want to boost anymore. I just want it, you know, the organic to sort of do its thing and the engagement level is going through the roof and the client's super happy and, you know, wants to do more and all that sort of stuff. So it's, it's pretty amazing to see that happen in real time. And I'm um, hoping to turn him into like a, a serious channel. I mean, he's, he's about to hit 5,000 subscribers, which, you know, when you think of a corporate, you know, very dry subject channel, yeah. I think it's pretty, it's pretty great. And, you know, they're not there to make money from the videos. They're there to bring clients in and get people to talk to them to become their clients. And it's working for them. So to me, that was like this little win that I had over the weekend that felt really great. Yeah. And I think that's a great point because, you know, both me and you have worked on channels where if we released a video that got a thousand views in its first few days, that would be considered an absolute train wreck yeah but it all depends on the niche and you know if you're making money from adsense and that's no good but if you're bringing in leads to a you know a high level i don't know that i don't know the niche but you know a high level services business for an example you know you can potentially make 
tens of thousand dollars from one lead. So exactly, yeah, that's, that's really interesting. We're going to be talking about something that is very kind of industry specific this week, and we're going to be talking about MCNs, which is a bit of a kind of bit of a poison word in the industry <laughs> to a certain extent. Um, but before we dive into that topic, can you please tell our loving audience about our amazing sponsor this week? We are supported and sponsored by our friends at TubeBuddy.com. TubeBuddy is a powerful YouTube management tool that helps you save time and optimize your channel. And if you visit our unique link at www.videoinsiders.fm slash TubeBuddy, you'll be able to sign up multiple channels at once, which is great if you're running some kind of small network. And you'll also be able to get our unique discount, which is exclusive just for you Video Insiders. So what is the current state of the MCN world? What is an MCM, Tom? So in its most basic sense, MCN stands for a multi-channel network. So basically, this is a kind of conglomerate of channels that are kept inside a big CMS by one central company. And the basic premise is that you put your channel into their network, their CMS, they administer the account and they will give you certain benefits. And those benefits have changed over the years and we'll discuss that. But ultimately, they will take a percentage of your ad revenue and remember that the ad revenue is going directly to them and then they pay you from what they collect directly from their AdSense account in exchange for some sort of value. And I think that value exchange is what has really, really changed over the years. And certainly since we got started back in you know 2012 and Carlos, if you can kind of enlighten the audience, if they're not really au fait with this world, what what was that? What was that offer? What was the value that MCNs purported to bring back in 2012? Uh, there were a bunch of things. They were promising higher CPMs, and I just want to backtrack a bit. You do say you do say CMS, and you know some people don't understand what a CMS is. Okay, yeah, yeah, fair point. You know, a CMS stands for Content Management System. It's a very common lingo online for, you know, a WordPress site is a comment, content management system. Everything has a content management system online and YouTube has its own. In 2012, you know, networks were promising high CPMs or fixed CPMs. I remember, you know, everybody on YouTube was making money and, but it was fluctuating. They didn't understand how that money was, you know, one day they make, you know, $5 per thousand and then the next day they'd make two dollars per thousand we all have to deal with the january dip yeah and all that sort of stuff and i remember when when i was managing just for laughs you know we started talking with an mcn that starts with an r and ends with a three they ended up giving us an awesome fixed cpm right and that helped us sort of understand know okay for the next year we know we're going to make this amount of money which as a company companies seek that right they want that security they don't want to you know feel like you know the the bottom can drop and that was one of the big things funny enough they, back then they didn't they also didn't offer much in terms of support there was also content id as well for the smaller creators. Companies already had that, but for smaller creators, when I say smaller creators, but smaller successful creators, their content was being still being pirated around the world and you know, Content ID would help clear that up for them. But yeah, I think those, that was sort of like the basic offering back then for me. Yes, yeah, so I, I wanna go back to the revenue. So how was it that, that they were able to offer a higher CPM than YouTube were offering. What was it that, you know, were they doing it out of pocket just to get you on board and then try and extract value from you over the years? Were there upsells? What was it that was, you know, giving them the power to pay more than you would be able to make on your own? Not necessarily, uh, you know, your channel just for laughs. I wouldn't expect you to kind of divulge that information, but generally, and not just the, the MCN you're talking about either, but how were MCNs able to offer more money than YouTube directly? What, what MCNs fundamentally were, were an ad sales uh, team, an ad sales service, right? They had certain accesses to YouTube or Google's AdSense that were higher level than your average creator. And what they were able to do is they were already set up within Google's ecosystem as uh, preferred sellers. So essentially, the network's team was allowed to go out 
into the world and sell ads on YouTube directly to brands and agencies, uh, all those pre-rolls and all that sort of stuff. They were able to sell directly. And the way they would sell it, they would sell it at a premium. They would talk to you know your, the Cokes of this world and say, we can get, give you Lily Singh. Uh, specifically. And that was one of the th- problems back in the day in YouTube. And to this day, it, it, it's really hard for a brand to say, I just want to be in front of this creator. It's there. People can do it. But it, it, they just put it behind this black hole of like, how do I do this? Or I need to spend at least a million dollars to do this. Whereas back in the day, the, the MCNs were able to sort of like do this a, a little bit lower than what Google would offer them. And they were selling these CPMs at back in the heyday of like awesome CPMs, they would sell $30, $20 CPMs. Again, to, to, to explain the lingo, a CPM is a cost per thousand. That's how uh, advertisers buy ads. Again, we're talking to video incisors, but sometimes you know people don't always understand the, the lingo in, in the advertising world. That's what we're here for, to teach them, Carlos. Exactly. So yeah, that's the, how they were able to pay more than, than, than Google would. But also, I think that was a very big gamble for them because they were projecting, you know, a head, you know, they would say, okay, this channel's got a million subscribers, generates 5 million views a day. We're certain that our sales team can sell this, this, the inventory. And they would gauge that. One of the things that ended up happening is they weren't able to do that, right? At the end of those contracts, you would often end up, and that's my experience is, is like, yeah, after a year, they're like, yeah, we can't give you that fixed contract, that fixed rate anymore. Yeah. And what I don't think a lot of people realize is You can still do this for yourself today. I know it's not straightforward, but you can go to YouTube if you've gotten someone there that you can talk to and you can buy your own ad inventory. Let's say you're getting a billion views a year. You can buy back that ad inventory. Let's just say, for example, you're buying it at um, $1 CPM. I'm just making that you know, yep. simple for, for number sake. So you buy your billion views inventory from YouTube uh, for a dollar uh, per thousand views. And then you can go off and sell that if you've got a good sales team or if you're a great salesman or if you've got a single brand that wants to be associated with you, you can sell that same inventory for $2 and so then you're making a hundred percent margin on that that ad inventory that you're basically buying and selling on. So it's just arbitrage of that um, of those eyeballs basically. And I know this is not this is not like you can't just ring up YouTube and say, "Hey, I want to I don't want to start selling ads." It's very technical. Obviously, there's risk involved because you need to find uh, advertisers that are going to buy that inventory from you. But it is, I'd say, I don't know, what's your experience, Carlos? How many companies have you come across that have their own ad sales team? There have only been the MCNs at this point. And and to be honest, in the previous company I was in, we tried to, to go into that space. But, you know, one of the things that Google requested was proof of a team, right? They asked us, like, oh, th- what's, where's your sales team? Right. And uh, I don't know if that was something that, you know, you you came across as, but, you know, you, you were working at a BBC, that's a completely different ecosystem. But us, we're a produ- we were a production company. Yes, we had channels with, you know, a couple million views a month, but they literally told us, it's like, you need to have a dedicated sales team to uh, be able to prove that you could be able to sell these. So that's where we hit a wall when we tried to get into this space. Yeah, I've worked for a couple of companies that did have their own sales team, but they found the process very difficult, um, very technical, um, you know, in terms of like the ad platforms and stuff, um, very hard to project what inventory you've got available, that kind of stuff. So it, it never worked out to be hugely profitable. So, you know, I think, you know, there's a big, onus or you know a big bonus even for them to just sit back and let youtube do the kind of the hard work when it comes to selling that inventory Uh, and i think they are getting better at it but it's it's not easy obviously yeah so we've took we've talked about increased cpms and i think that was always the big that was always the big carrot that they dangled in front of creators we will help you to monetize much better we'll get you better ad rates and stuff you also mentioned content id that was a a very uh 
good play. And I think that's still a play that is being used today because despite the increase of uh, in introduction of new tools for copyright protection, I still think if you don't have CMS or access to CMS, it's really hard to protect your interests on YouTube. Can you remember some of the other other features that um, were kind of really kind of low touch, but really easy for MCNs to offer that were being kind of banded about in those early days? Huh. Um, low touch. Well, well, the only, the one that I remember, uh, the, um, I don't consider it low touch. It's more, you know, they, they, they offered community, right. They offered, a, you know, yeah. people to, to, to talk to support you. Right. I remember we went to LA, you know, back in the day and we paid a visit. This is back in the day when, you know, all the MCNs would woo you, right. They would like call you up and like, come visit us, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. Right. And, you know, we paid a visit to full screen. We paid a visit to maker studios and like maker studios were, was amazing you know there was a huge place and ton stuff happening and you felt like you were like wow you know like there's a lot of stuff happening over here and yeah you felt like there was like you know a, a support system for you as a quote-unquote creator right like you know we were behind the scenes but you know like one of the things that i always had an in a sort of personal sort of like i was torn because i have this you know I love the creator ecosystem. I love creators and, you know, we're the behind the scenes guys. And, uh, we almost feel like we're in that, in that ecosystem, you know, whenever I would visit, you know, maker or whatever at MCN, I'd felt, I'd felt really great. Right. And it was just, it just felt like really great because they were like, you know, working with the creators, creating content, you know, trying to bring you deals, uh, all these things that, you know, in the end, we ended up finding out that they were all running on fumes <laughs> at the end of the day, right? They're all running on investor yeah. money and not making any money, which is, you know, we'll probably address the, the issue of like, why did they, where are they now? How come they mostly disappeared? Yeah. Well, also, you know, you were being worried yeah. as, a, as a high level creator, you know, your channel was big. It was valuable to somebody in that, in that world. But you've got to remember that really MCN's especially in the early days were a pure scale play you know they just wanted to get as many creators on board it was just stack them higher you know even if we're, if creators were making absolute pennies it meant that they were getting a cut of so many creators that all of those you know percentages of pennies yeah. all started to add up and that's really where the the money was made so you, you spoke about some kind of cool like community stuff and deals and i think some mcns also offered like yeah. we're going to teach you best practice of how to mm -hmm. upload and get more views and stuff like that but there were also a lot of really 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 low touch offers you know some people you know i think one of the biggest office from an MCN was yeah. we'll get you into the partner program. You know, you can make it because you couldn't, it wasn't True. so easy to get into the partner program um, as it is today. And it wasn't kind of self-service. So it's like, well, you can start monetizing your videos tomorrow. If you sign up to a network, whatever it may be. Also, if you weren't part of the partner program, then you couldn't have stuff like custom channel art and custom thumbnails. <laughs> and, you know, so let's say join, join us at MCN and you can have custom thumbnails and people are like, yeah, you can have 30% like <laughs> of my revenue <laughs> so I can have custom thumbnails. And if you remember back, back then as well, you could sign the channel up oh, by wow. getting them to click like a single button. It was pretty outrageous. And, you know, people were getting locked into long term contracts, obviously, very young people that weren't reading the terms and conditions. And when they went to leave, you know, some MCNs were saying that they, you know, there was like a two year. Really? Yeah, I remember. No, 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 no. no. I, I'm saying really because I'm surprised because that's pretty short because I remember three years. I remember indefinite, you <laughs> yeah. know, and I remember horror stories of like yeah. the, the channels essentially owned forever by uh, the, uh, I'll, I'll even name it by the machinimas of this world right back in the day. Right. So yeah, no, no, I remember that stuff. And then also like if you ran a large channel when there used to be like a proper message inbox system, yes, it would just be full of people saying, join this network. You know, we've, we, we think you can join this network, click this one button and you'll be part of it. And then what you'd see is they would have like affiliate programs. So there'd be like sub networks oh, and networks and sub sub networks. And it would just be like a big 
pyramid scheme of these networks just trying to roll up as many creators as possible because it was all about just if we you know if we can get a million creators yep. and they're all making a dollar each yep. you know we get a percentage of that but then there's a couple of things that i think really happened and really kind of were the catalyst for the for the kind of slow demise of the mcn as we know it i think first of all is that they scaled up to such an extent that they had more inventory than they could sell they started suffering from the same problems that youtube had is that there wasn't enough demand for what they had in in supply so they could no longer offer good cpms to their partners because they Uh couldn't sell the inventory because they just had too much and then the second was that youtube started to say um well basically you need to take more responsibility for those channels that are in your networks so if your channels are getting copyright strikes and they're using music and they're using clips from movies and stuff that's your responsibility so all of a sudden overnight these networks that had you know been signing up channels that they'd never even heard of because they were just getting them to click on a link somewhere all of a sudden their cms's were getting just absolutely carpet bombed with copyright strikes left right and center and they were being threatened that they would be losing any kind of um cms they might have so all of a sudden they started putting them into like sub cms's and kicking channels out left right and center that's true you have an awesome memory because you're like giving me ptsd like flashbacks right because i remember that i remember like (laughs) managing cms's and like all of a sudden like oh one channel got a got a strike and now the cms level has a strike and like oh we have to deal with this and you know youtube uses that cms like uh, like golden handcuffs right they 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 dangle that stuff and it's like as soon as you mess up one thing they start cutting back all these tools that you have and as a company that's high very risky they've essentially you know youtube youtube and google they're always it's sort of like part of their dna they, they create these tools that are like hey try this out you know figure figure things out for us and then we figure it out we create a business around it and they're like yeah these tools are a little bit too powerful for you so we're going to start cutting back we're going to start cutting back a little bit and then, you know, finding ways to cut this back more and more over the years to a point where like they just choke whatever business you've set up using those tools. And it, this is exactly what happened with the MCNs at this point, right? It just, you know, from, from the AdSense to, you know, limiting sales to limiting, again, the, the whole strike thing. So, yeah, it just, uh, it just kept getting tighter and harder to manage. But it, having said all of that, it can't have been that bad of a time for MCNs because there was a wave. I'm guessing I'm I'm, I'm going to hazard a guess to say it was around probably like 2015, maybe that um, all of these MCNs started slowly to get swallowed yep. up by kind of traditional media companies. The most famous of all probably being. Uh, maker studios being sold to disney for what was rumored to be about half a billion dollars at the time there was like oh my god that's so much money and then i thought pretty soon after that was probably a bit of a bargain but in hindsight now you'd probably say that was well can you update us and first of all and say tell us where are maker studios today (laughs) well maker studios today is essentially gone uh it, it's it's been absorbed by by disney it's it's there in in some form or way i do think they overpaid for it these mcns they sold on the big numbers right the big numbers the number of creators and all that sort of stuff you know media companies back then they didn't know much about the web right they were like oh wow these numbers are great you know like there we can make we can establish ourselves there, there might have been a talent play as well yeah definitely But at the same time, the talent wasn't very TV savvy or wasn't very sort of big media savvy, right? So what ended up happening is all the talent ended up disappearing and most of the talent ended up disappearing, right? Or leaving their contracts or, you know, dissolving their contracts. MCNs from a creator level being uh, a a good buy for, for many companies because most of the ones that did buy something, they've all sort of been dissolved or, or ingested into the company company into something else and as somebody who essentially tried to build an mcn within a production company and stuff like that and you know we didn't have all the right pieces to build one but 
we quickly saw that these tools or the, this, the CMS was much more powerful from a content distribution way than, than a talent management way. And I think that's that's where, you know, again, this is my perspective, but from my perspective, that's where these companies ended up benefiting is understanding how YouTube's content ID works, which is has always been a black hole to this day. You know, to, like just last week, I onboarded a new client who had no idea they had content ID. And they're, you know, they own hundreds of episodes of TV shows and, and, and movies. And I'm like, mm. and their CMS was, wasn't being managed. It was still owned by an ex employee that had left. And like, you know, there, there's bad education in this space. And these big companies by absorbing these, these, uh, these networks got to educate themselves very quickly on how to manage their properties online. I think that was the biggest benefit for them yeah from you know when you said when you said earlier that you thought it was a talent play i totally agreed um but i wasn't thinking it of the same angle that you just came at it but what you just said is absolutely true you know you've got digital expertise at hand in-house you know you don't need to go to agencies and it basically becomes like an in-house agency but what i was thinking more of the line of is you've bought people with existing audiences that have the demographic audience that exactly what you're looking for because you know disney are not getting to those later stage teenagers on tv anymore they're not watching linear tv but you know they might be watching shay carl videos or whoever was i think was pewdiepie yeah. at maker studios back in those days maybe those kind of people and so for me it was a smart buy because instantly you've just got a distribution network that you can get your products and promotional stuff in front of and you've you've bought an instant audience of of millions on the platforms that they want to watch and if you can remember so maker studios is now i think it's disney digital yep. disney digital networks um and that actually i was doing some research today and they actually sit within the consumer products division yep. of disney which i think says it all because it you know it's mm -hmm. just now a big advertising platform but can you remember carlos what the big kind of youtube event that happened soon after the acquisition which i thought was genius but when i would kind of looked at the actual event it was pretty horrific hmm. um you 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 threw me a curveball I have don't remember it's it's very it's very consumer product centric. I, first off, one thing we, you'll learn as we go through this podcast and we we sort of like understand how we, our personalities is that I have a <laughs> horrible memory. So I, uh, you know, so tell me, <laughs> I'm I'm waiting. They did a I think I don't know how it, an all day Star Wars product day where they got all of Maker's top talent into a studio and released and kind of unveiled the brand new Star Wars merch piece by piece. There was like cosplay and toys and all of that good stuff on a YouTube live stream. And I thought, this is it. They've, they've nailed the formula. They've got big YouTube stars just hawking merch. They're not trying to hide it. This is genius. But obviously that didn't work. <laughs> and it, it got, I think it got pretty widely derided as just being so over commercial and not in the spirit of the, of the creator, which is, I think, you know, a massive problem with the, the kind of influence and marketing space in general, which is obviously a massive problem. It all went kind of downhill for maker as it was. And then I think they went from something like, 50,000 maker creators down to like a thousand. They just cut people left, right, and center. Uh, and I think one of the problems and one of the reasons that these um, MCNs get acquired and then kind of dissolved is really apparent with what's having, happening at Machinima. Uh, and that's been all over the trade press, you know, this week that we go to, um, that we record this podcast, Carlos. So can you kind of update the listeners on what happened first of all with the, the kind of notorious email that got sent around and then what happened, uh, 
on YouTube this week with with their channel. I missed that part about the notorious email. Ah, well, yes, it's the the email that they sent around, basically saying, "Oh, hi, Machinima creators, you're now full screen creators." Oh, okay. Well, yeah, you know that that's that's sort of like par for the course in this space. But um, yeah, essentially, all uh, videos from the Machina channel went down over the weekend. <laughs> With you know not much of a warning, and that what that wasn't that wasn't like YouTube taking them down. Machinima took them down. They just basically nuked their entire channel, which had had how many how many million views and subscribers? Views I don't remember, but I know it had something like eighteen million. It's one of the things that like really surprises me. Oh, sorry, twelve million subscribers. You know, one of the things that always surprises me because to me this is a content play, right? It's like the you you. you Otter Media, which owns full screen, just basically bought these channels that are, you know, have been running on fumes for, you know, many years. Probably wants to use that content to be redistributed. Or, you know, I have no idea. At this point, it feels very weird that they took it all down because maybe they had creator content out there that they didn't have the full rights for, right? And uh, now that they've been bought by a big media company, uh, which I feel like Machinima was owned by another company before that as well, because I feel like Machinima has been bought a few times. Machinima was, was um, Warner Brothers, yeah. wasn't it? Something like that, maybe. Uh, but yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, it just goes to show like that, you know, when creators sign up to a, to a network like that, you, you sort of like lose control, right? And one of the things that I feel that, you know, has really hurt the scene is that, you know, the, the, the misunderstanding of w- what a creator, you know, has done or the work they've done, right? And they feel like they've done it all themselves, right? They've, you know, they've built their audience themselves. And when you sign with a, a network and a network, you know, decides to, to move, move the cheese and move things around, be, you know, that, that totally affect your world, that turns creators off. It would turn me off. I don't want to pay a company that all of a sudden is owned by another company and another company has a different vision or doesn't have the same philosophy as, as what I want, you know, the reason why I, I signed up for Machinima and all that sort of stuff. So it's a weird move. I find it weird because it's just you know, like, uh, I personally think that the subscriber number is a, v- a complete vanity number. So, you know, the value is not really in the channel. The value is in the, in the content for, you know, networks, right? Well, for me, I just think it's a total kind of, it reeks of just corporate behavior. So they've kind of put two brands together that have got no kind of um, yeah. crossover but it works. They just put them into the same entity and they've not really considered the identity or the feelings of those creators. It just, what works for corporate is going to happen. And then secondly, by taking the content down again, it's a super corporate move. It's like, we can't a hundred percent vouch for all this gaming content that's on here. So we're going to totally de-risk it and we're just going to delete it all. Yeah. it's, It's a very lawyery move to do. Yeah, exactly. And that's the that's the difference between a kind of agile startup that's kind of on the edge, making stuff off as they go. You know, when Machinima started, you know, this this industry just didn't exist. So they kind they of... They were one of the first. You know, went by the seat of their pants and did what worked. Yeah, so a lot of the content that they prayed, made early on was probably, you know, parodies and make, using other people's content, mashups and whatnot. But a corporate entity, you know, they need compliance and they need right sign off and all that kind of stuff so that's kind of um you know typical corporate behavior which you can't blame them for because you know they've got shareholders and they need to tick all the boxes and uh, you know (laughs) health and safety and all that kind of stuff so you know where, where do most of these networks sit today what is the kind of current state of play for the mcn do they are there any kind of traditional MCNs that even still exist? What's the landscape today? I feel like they've all become influencer networks at this point. They've all sort of evolved into um, uh, you know networks that uh, manage people as opposed to manage channels. And I think even recently, um, Studio Seventy One just launched a new division um, that the name escapes me. Uh, that is primarily focused on talent management. And to me, that just, it's sort of like this, it's always been talent management. Since the beginning, it's always been talent management. It's just that, um, 
the you know we were focused on the networks and and the channels and it's almost like old school hollywood talent managers couldn't understand the digital space and for some reason or another did not believe in digital talent did not believe in in digital fame so these networks became the talent managers that the digital stars need that's you know essentially what where they are at this point like they've all become super niche you get uh, mom uh, specific MCNs, but they're all very small because I think at the end of the day, the way YouTube has neutered everybody's ability to manage channels keeps it so that they can't grow too big uh, because it just becomes unmanageable and unprofitable, especially from a, a YouTube channel perspective. So the only ones that can really grow are the ones that sign talent on a you know talent basis, right? You know, he's an influencer, he has Instagram, he's got Twitter, he's got Facebook, blah, blah, blah. They create these packages for for brands and whoever wants to work with them. That's where I think it's all at at this point. The networks aren't really there there's still a few out there. It's funny when you were saying about our me- the the messages that we used to get and the, the PMs that we used to get on uh, on YouTube. Like it just you gave me again PTSD. I've no I realized that I haven't gotten a PM like that in like six months. Mm. I was still getting them last year. Yeah, people are still getting them all the time. So I'm I'm in a lot of kind of Facebook groups for creators and. You know, almost on a weekly basis, someone will say, "Has anyone ever heard of this network?" They've just email, they've just messaged me on. Actually, it's, it seems to be yes, they're, they're getting yes, hold of yes. email addresses now and doing it rather than from the YouTube platform. But you can easily find someone's email address from the YouTube channel, and they're saying they've offered me this and said they can help me grow my channel and they're going to give me yeah. epidemic sound and blah 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 and blah 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 blah. Like, has anyone? ever used them before and then just the yeah. community comes in and says you don't need a network you know don't do the it's the same it's the same cycle and i just i think that that type of kind of generic network is on the way out if they're not already totally dead i think there's still a few kind of picking up the scraps but in terms of the future i think you've hit the nail on the head and i think it's going to be if they exist at all it will be just pure niches. So it'll, like you say, it might be like mummy bloggers or it might be people that are in the automotive space or it might be people that are in Indonesia, for example, because, you know, the, the monetization there might not be so great because YouTube don't really have mm-hmm. maybe like a sales team in Indonesia. But if they all, if all the big channels in Indonesia club together and can get a local sales team, then maybe that kind of... Um, AdSense arbitrage play will still work. Again, that's only got a limited uh, amount of time. So I'm not sure how long that will last, but I don't think they're going to totally go away. I still think content ID is a big selling point for a lot of people. I know there's like copyright match tools and stuff like that, but on a bigger scale, that may not be up to snuff. Um, But then, you know, there are now dedicated content ID companies that negate the need to have a MCN style contract. Um, I've got really good friends with, that have set up a company called Super Bam. Uh, Ryan over there, super, super smart guy. Um, got a fantastic company, a fantastic business model where they help to protect or monetize people's UGC and they don't require any kind of channel roll up or anything like that. So um, I think MCNs have probably got, you know, maybe three, four, five years, especially in further reaches of the world. Um, but not, I don't think they've got long left in, in the kind of traditional sense. Yeah. I think, um, uh, uh, sort of the way you said that there's still like a growing scene when it comes to networks, um, outside of the North America, right. I actually helped set up this huge uh what's turned into like a huge network in in uh, bangladesh <laughs> and you know uh it was basically somebody who created a channel and they had they own they were owned rights and i set them up in, with their own cms and next thing you know he's the number one mcn in the market and he's signing up creators left and right but at the same time, I know for the fact that YouTube has shut down most uh, CMS's ability to invite channels. So that's where, you know, it sort of forces these companies to become more like agents than anything else. Uh, the the AdSense ad inventory part of the, th- the situation has become much harder to manage unless you're grandfathered in 
or your name is BBC, or, you know, you have like a huge amount of, or you're, you're well known as a, you know, a distribution company, right? It's not a, a bright future for that type of, uh, of network at this point. <laughs> Well, Carlos, thank you. That was a great trip down um, horrific memory lane. All of those lovely affiliate sub-network you invitations I was getting that were so personalized. And they definitely weren't copy and pasted. Please don't tell me they were copy and pasted. <laughs> they definitely weren't copy and pasted. I love that one. Um, you know what? Part of me misses those days. You know, like I miss those days because it felt, it felt like the Wild West, you know? And it was like every day was like, oh, wow. You know, I didn't realize that. It was the Wild West. That's why it definitely was. Yeah, I know. And it definitely was the Wild West. And it sort of goes back to our previous episodes where, you know, YouTube has to grow up, enforce these, these rules and analogy for the, all the internet these days. Like it feels like all these platforms that have been going, doing the wild west for the past, you know, uh, past few years are, are sort of like forced to button up and get their act in gear, you know, for maybe TikTok is the wild west these days. Right. And it's like, that's, it feels like that's the only way an app can grow, right. Or a, a platform can grow. It's like you, you, you play, you play dumb or you create something that people can, can do UGC, but also, you know, use copyrighted content that, and, and then the company's like, uh, we don't know how to control this yet but you know we'll figure it out sooner or later and all that sort of stuff and you build that mass anyways it feels like those type of, of, of networks have become limited uh tiktok is feels like literally the last of those type of networks that can do that but obviously i think they already have a music deal so which is why they they're able to get away with it but um yeah i'm just rambling at this point but it's it's yeah, so please um, tune in next week, guys, to um, hear the premiere of our new show, which is two old grizzled YouTube <laughs> veterans react to TikTok. It's so funny because, like, I was talking to um, employees who are like in their twenties and stuff, and they're like, "Yeah, I don't touch TikTok. It makes me feel old." <laughs> well, um, on that bombshell, uh, we're going to wrap up this week's conversation. But and we'd love to know what you think. So please um, tweet at us. It's you can tweet at. Video insiders, or you can tweet me at channel underscore fuel. Yeah, and Carlos has got the worst Twitter handle ever, so we're not going to be reading that out every single week. Of course, we want to say a massive thank you to our friends and supporters over at TubeBuddy. And remember, you can sign up multiple channels at once and get a unique discount by visiting www.videoinsiders.fm forward slash. TubeBuddy. I would like to add also one of the comments you mentioned about forums. TubeBuddy has an awesome forum that with a lot of active people that support each other and give great advice. Um, there are a lot of pros in that forum that listen to you and uh, give you very sound advice when it comes to, you know, when that MCN sends you a, an invite. Don't reply to that MCN. <laughs> um, please uh, give us a rate and a review in whatever podcast you listen to us on do subscribe and tell a friend yeah and uh you're off to vi are, are we i don't know if we're going to record another episode before you're off to vidcon but this will probably be uh this episode will be after vidcon so hopefully you'll come back from that uh with some uh some insights some insider tales to tell indeed okay see you next week guys bye have a good one